The next part of the notes in Chapter 17, Additional Aspects of Aqueous Equilibria for AP Chemistry, deals with the solubility equilibria. This would be the solubility of something that is dissolving in water. So all dissolving exists as an equilibrium between the solid and the aqueous phase. So here's an example of barium sulfate turning into barium ions and sulfate ions. And if there's not much solid, it will all dissolve. As more solid is added to the solution, it eventually becomes saturated, and then the solid will precipitate as fast as it dissolves. So some of it's turning into aqueous ions and some of it is solidifying. And at equilibrium, you can express the K value, the solubility product is what the KSP stands for, uh, as the product's um, concentrations divided by the reactant concentration. Now, because the reactant concentration is just a solid, we don't show that in equilibrium expressions. So you're just going to have the products in solubility product expressions. And the uh, solubility product is an equilibrium constant, so you can treat it like every other equilibrium constant we've done so far. And it doesn't change unless you change the temperature. A lot of times if you increase the temperature, the salts will dissolve more, so the K value will increase. Now we come to some definitions. Solubility is not the same as solubility product. Solubility tells you how much stuff is dissolved to form a solution that's classified as being saturated. So it's how many grams dissolve or maybe how many moles dissolve. Solubility is an equilibrium position for how much can actually dissolve. Now if you call the solubility a molar solubility, it's telling you how many moles dissolve. If you just say general solubility, it might be grams or could be pounds or any unit. Usually it's grams because we're in the metric system. But if it's molar solubility, it tells you how many moles of solute can dissolve uh, in a liter of the solution. Now, the common ion effect does affect salts, and that's going to decrease their solubilities. The common ion effect prevents weak acids or weak bases from uh, dissociating as much, and so if you have a common ion, it will prevent uh, an insoluble or a slightly soluble salt from dissolving. Now, you can compare the solubility of one salt to another just by looking at the K values as long as they fall into the same, uh, they fall apart into the same number of ions. Um, and if you have something like sodium chloride, which breaks up into two ions, or potassium chloride, which also breaks up into two ions, whoever has the larger K value will dissolve more. But if they fall apart into a different number of pieces, a different number of ions in the solution, then you're going to have to actually calculate the X value when you're doing one of the icebox problems, one of the icebox calculations, to figure out who's got a bigger X value. X is kind of code for the molar solubility of the particular salt. So if you're comparing sodium chloride to magnesium chloride, sodium chloride falls into two pieces, magnesium chloride falls apart into three ions, three pieces, so you'd have to actually solve for X in the icebox and then you can compare those values. We do practice problems in the class on those. So we're going to look at an example of calculating the solubility product, that's the K value, given the concentration of the salt in the solution. So we have calcium fluoride breaking apart in equilibrium with its calcium ions and its fluoride ions. And then you can write the K expression as the concentration of calcium raised to the first power and the concentration of fluorine squared. The fluoride ion has to be squared because there's a little two in front of it. The concentration of the calcium ion is the same as the concentration of the salt originally because they're in a one-to-one -one mole ratio. But the concentration of the fluorine ions is twice the salt because it's in a one to two mole ratio. So you have to take those concentrations, plug them into your equilibrium expression, and then solve for the K value, and you get 7.63 times 10 to the negative ninth. There are no units for the K. And if you're going to be using the formula for, if you're going to be using the expression um, K equals a concentration, those brackets mean that it's a molarity. So you have to make sure that it's moles per liter. Now, how does solubility get affected by the common ion effect? I alluded to this earlier. It's an application of Le Chatelier's principle. If you have an ion already in the solution, it's going to shift the equilibrium to the left. And I show that in this example. If you add more fluorine ions into the solution, let's say from adding a strong electrolyte, that's something that dissolves a lot, like sodium fluoride, it's going to shift the equilibrium away from the ions to the solid. So you're going to increase the amount of calcium fluoride that is formed and so you get a precipitate. And as the sodium fluoride is added to the system, the solubility of the calcium fluoride is going to decrease. 
and if the fluoride ion is removed from the solution, Le Chatelier tells us that the reaction will shift to the right to replace the fluoride ions you're removing. One of the ways you can take out the fluoride ions is by adding a strong acid to it. The hydrogen ions would react to the fluoride ions to form the weak acid molecule hydrogen fluoride. And so if you add an acid to it, that actually increases the solubility because it removes the fluoride ions. So pH can affect the solubility of calcium fluoride. pH affects the solubility of salts that are weakly acidic or weakly basic. Or strongly acidic or strongly basic. So they don't affect the, the solubility of a neutral salt. So here's an example of one. It's magnesium hydroxide. It's only slightly soluble. And if you added a strong acid to this equilibrium, what in essence that would be doing is removing the hydroxide ions from the solution. So if you remove the hydroxide ions, more magnesium hydroxide can form. So you apply Le Chatelier's principle, the hydrogen ion from the acid removes the OH to make water, and then if you were to decrease the pH more and more, that increases the concentration of the hydrogen ions, so you can remove more and more of the hydroxides, so magnesium hydroxide dissolves better in an acid. And again, the effect is most significant if one or both of the ions are at least somewhat acidic or somewhat basic. So in general, the solubility of a slightly soluble salt that contains basic ions increases as the pH decreases. So if you have a basic ion, it would be dissolving better if it was an acid, or if you have an acid ion, it would dissolve better if it's basic. And the more basic this, the, the anion is, then the greater this effect would be. Here are some other strange um, solubility effects. Um, this is called additional aspects of aqueous equilibria, and one of the one of the topics is uh, complex ions. You see it every once in a while on AP exams, so I put it in the notes, but it's not stressed that much in my class. I just introduce it to tell the students, hey, the complex ions do exist. So some metal ions, which are obviously called cations, can form a soluble complex ion when in a solution. And here's an example of one. If you have silver ions in a solution and you add the molecule ammonia to it, it actually can form a silver ammonia complex. That silver ammonia complex is called a complex ion. It's where you've attached a molecule called a ligand to or a ligand to the silver. And the equilibrium constant can be written for this reaction as products over reactants raised to their stoichiometric powers. And it's given a symbol Kf because it's the formation constant for that complex ion. Now how is this used? Well, consider the slightly, very, very slightly soluble salt silver chloride. You could classify it as being insoluble because the K value is so crazy small. Um, but it exists in an equilibrium between the silver ions and the chloride ions. If you were to throw in ammonia ions onto silver chloride solid in a solution, what would happen is that the silver ions would be removed from the solution because they would form a complex with the ammonia molecule. And so the overall reaction looks like this. You have silver chloride solid plus the ammonia molecules turning into a, a silver ammonia complex and the chloride ions. So basically you're, you're removing silver ions from the solution so more and more silver chloride can dissolve. So if you want to dissolve silver chloride, throw in some ammonia. And uh, here's another example. An amphoteric oxide is, a, is an oxide where it, is, it can dissolve either in a, a strong acid or a strong base by forming a complex. So here is an aluminum hydroxide solid that has some water molecules stuck to it, and then it dissolves more in an acid or more in a base. So you can increase the solubility of this aluminum hydroxide solid by forming that weird complex. Again, this is a very strange situation. You wouldn't expect to see this on an AP test. And uh, the next part of the notes deals with the solubility guidelines, and I actually describe that as lecture number two. On my website, it's actually lecture number three, because again, I had to add this lecture in because I forgot to. So that's the end of this presentation.